All right, so we are going to finish up our discussion on intermolecular forces by starting out with hydrogen bonding. Um, a thing about hydrogen bonds is that if you can keep track of the information that we discussed in the previous video regarding dipole-dipole interactions, you'll be in good shape here for hydrogen bonds um, because a hydrogen bond is really just a special kind of dipole-dipole interaction. It's going to require a molecule that has a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, a nitrogen, a fluorine, and sometimes you'll see hydrogen bonding occur when a hydrogen is bound to a sulfur as well. Um, compared to your normal dipole-dipole interaction, hydrogen bonds are ridiculously strong. And I say comparatively here because all things are relative and are pretty environmentally um, sensitive uh, in terms of does that actually, um, what I'm trying to get at is if you were going to put these in a scale, you would say your dispersion forces, then your dipole forces, and then your hydrogen bonds um, for strength of intermolecular force. Now, we say that this is really strong, and this table that we've got here will help us articulate why. Let's specifically take a look-see at these molecules, molecules here on the far left. Um, first off, let's look at our axes. We've got boiling point, and it is increasing as we go up the y-axis, and then we have period, and this is going to be the uh, which group in our uh, periodic table the central atom is in. Um, so I apologize. This is going to be what row we're in, and then the lines are our group. Uh, groups. So each red line here, or the blue line, is group 17, so everything down. The halogens, the red line, the chalcogens, uh, green line, the picogen, picogens, and then group 14. But as we go across, we're just going to be saying, like, hey, um, we're just changing that period. So we're going down as we go on the periodic table. Groovy. Cool. This was the one that I really wanted to highlight way out here, uh, specifically looking at water versus hy hydrogen fluoride versus ammonia versus um, methane. So we've talked previously that methane is this molecule that is nonpolar, um, and so it's really only going to have van der Waals interactions with it. And as such, those interactions between individual methane molecules aren't very strong. So we expect and we do see a low boiling point because the interactions between the methane molecules are weak. As we go up in this chart, though, we see that we now have polar molecules. So now we have dipole-dipole interactions that are possible. When we get to the ammonia, the hydrogen fluoride, and the water, we see really big boiling points. Um, and the thing to note about nitrogen, fluorine, and oxygen are that these are pretty electronegative atoms. Um, the trend, if we ignore just that uh, period two group, the rest of the trend is saying, hey, over here on the uh, right-hand side, as we get bigger molecules from we're, from using um, central atoms that are increasing in their period, so the difference of going from sulfur to selenium to tellurium, um, the difference of going from chlorine, bromine, and iodine, as we're dropping down um, in a group, down the periods, we're increasing in our boiling points. But this first row out here is kind of this outlier. Um, and that's because our nitrogen, the fluorine, and the hydrogen are so electronegative that they are able to produce hydrogen bonding between two water molecules, between two hydrogen fluoride molecules, and two uh, ammonia molecules. So it's the hydrogen bonding that's capable or that's possible within these three molecules that allow uh, for this trend to be broken. If this trend wasn't broken, we'd kind of think um, we'd have something that's more in line with what the uh, purple line group 14 is showing us here. So that's an effect of hydrogen bonding. What does it actually look like? Well, we said that we have to have hydrogen that is bound to a a nitrogen, an oxygen, a fluorine, and sometimes a sulfur. Um, 
another way of stating that is that we have to have a hydrogen bond donor and we have to have a hydrogen bond acceptor. Um, so if we take a look, see at the molecule that we have right here, this is methanol. So CH3OH is methanol. If we draw out a Lewis structure for methanol, we're going to find that three hydrogens are around a carbon. The carbon is going to be linked to the oxygen. The oxygen is going to be linked to this hydrogen. We're going to have a single covalent bond here, and we're going to have two lone pairs around the oxygen in our methanol. We can use our Vesper structures and we can say, okay, this would, we would expect the uh, electron geometry around the oxygen to be tetrahedral and the molecular shape around the oxygen to be bent. And that's why we've got this molecule drawn out in this bent-like fashion. Okay. We've got this oxygen drawn here and written out in the about the same size as this hydrogen. This hydrogen, if you really think about it, is only one proton. It is super small as an atom compared to oxygen. Oxygen 16 times as big as this hydrogen. Um, and the oxygen's way more electronegative. So yeah, this bond looks like the electrons are being shared between the hydrogen and the oxygen. They're not really sharing. The oxygen's kind of saying, gimme. And we have this really ridiculously strong partial negative on this oxygen. Um, and then oxygen is pulling that electron density towards it and away from the hydrogen so much so that this hydrogen isn't freely uh, like an ion where it's popping off with a formal plus charge but it's got a really strong pos uh, positive partial charge around it so much of a partial positive charge that the electron pair off of a different m methanol so this oxygen is different from the other one right the lone pair off of this oxygen is able to interact with the partial positive charge on this hydrogen. And the hydrogen's like, sure, I'll partially bond with you too. And this through space interaction between this lone pair and this hydrogen is the hydrogen bond. Now it's not really a bond in this way that a covalent bond is or an ionic bond is, but it's a really strong intermolecular force. It's a very strong through space interaction and you have to have a hydrogen bond donor and you have to have a hydrogen bond acceptor. Your acceptor would be this hydrogen and your donor would be this lone pair. So you've got this ability to form a hydrogen bond, this little pink area. Now let's take a look at this oxygen from the second methanol. This methanol also has a hydrogen coming off of it being bound by this covalent bond, right? Nyah. Well, there's nothing saying that this hydrogen off of our second methanol can't hydrogen bond to a third methanol. And this chaining can continue on and on and on and on. That's what allows these uh, substances that are capable of having hydrogen bonds to have such high boiling points relative to what we would normally have predicted. Um, water, for example, here is capable of having four different hydrogen bonds. And that makes sense if you draw out its structure. The hydrogen fluoride doesn't have as many, but this is a really quite polar molecule. And so that the interactions it does form are incredibly strong via hydrogen bonding. So this is an example of, and I, I like to call this why water is water. Um, if you draw out a Lewis structure for water, you're gonna see that the oxygen's gonna have two lone pairs on it, and it's gonna have two covalently bound hydrogens on it. Each one of the hydrogens that's covalently bound can have an individual hydrogen bond to a different water molecule's lone pair off of an oxygen. And you can draw out four different interactions for every water molecule with, a, with four other water molecules. You form this kind of green network that you're seeing here these kinds of interactions, um, the number of them and the strength of them is what allows water to have such a high boiling point. Um, in order to boil water, you have to break all of these interactions for the water to escape the other water molecules. Um, as you can see here, a lot of these water molecules are oriented in more specific capacities. They're not really, they're random, but they're not super random. Uh, there's a semi-order to it. This allows for the density of water to be what it is. It allows water molecules, when they're in the liquid phase, to get in pretty close to one another. The tighter packed 
you have, the more mass and, a, and less volume means you have a higher density. This kind of arrangement is why ice is less dense than liquid water. Um, when you actually start forming ice, you start forming very arranged patterns of your water molecules and the amount of mass that, of water that you can get in a certain volume ends up decreasing because these hydrogen bonds want the water molecules to line up in very specific ways. Um, and because they have to line up in very specific ways and the way that they have to then line up, it, provide, it, it just requires more volume for a given amount of mass. Whereas if that same amount of mass as a liquid, well, the molecules can get in there closer to one another, have smaller volume, and they end up with a higher density. So hydrogen bonding, why ice floats. Also, why water doesn't boil until it gets to a really high temperature. So now we've talked about London dispersion forces. We've talked about dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion-dipole. Here it is, folks. You have an ion and you have it interacting with polar molecules. Now, it's not one polar molecule per one ion because an ion has a formal positive charge and dipoles have partial positive and negative charges. So it's going to require a variety, like a number, a large number of polar molecules that have partial negatives to interact with a formal positive charge or vice versa. There's some pretty nice images in your textbook regarding that, but it's pretty straightforward. It's, um, and the difference between dipole-dipole and ion-dipole is you have an ion interacting with dipole um, stuff, and you have with dipole-dipole just polar molecules. You don't have any ions. So if we take a look at the strengths here in that far column, right, this is in kilojoules per mole. So the higher the number of kilojoules per mole, the stronger the interaction is. And as you can tell with London dispersion forces, yeah, like if you can have for really big nonpolar molecules, um, you could have a fairly strong interaction, but most of the time they're going to be pretty weak. And they're most of the time going to be way, uh, they're going to be under, if not way under the average strength for a dipole-dipole interaction. Now we said the hydrogen bonding was really strong, and indeed it is, at least compared to dipole-dipole interactions. Um, you're looking at uh, this 10 to 40 kilojoules per mole scale. An ion-dipole interaction is even stronger. Um, all of these, though, are pretty weak compared to even pretty average covalent bonds. So a covalent bond, remember, is not an intermolecular force. It's an intramolecular force. So your average strength for a chlorine-chlorine covalent intramolecular bond is 240 kilojoules per mole. That's a good bit bigger than even some of the stronger ion dipole interactions we can have. If you have a carbon oxygen triple bond, now you have something that's like almost 10, well it is 10 times bigger than what we think of our strongest ion dipole interactions, not to mention the London dispersion forces. So this is really just here to remind us that, yeah, while we have pretty strong interactions with um, these intermolecular forces, and they do affect things such as boiling and whether something would be in a liquid or a solid state at varying temperatures, at the end of the day, they're still pretty weak compared to covalent bonds. And this is to say nothing in regards to ionic bonding. Compared to ionic bonds, covalent bonds are pretty weak. So a London dispersion force compared to an ionic bond, there's no contest. Now, what are some of the things that are impacted by this intermolecular forces stuff? Well, we've mentioned freezing and boiling. Those are biggies. They really are biggies. Um, another thing is we have the phrase like dissolves like. So if you have two things that are, let's say, two solvents uh, that are both nonpolar, it's easier for them to interact with one another than it is for a polar solvent to work with a nonpolar solvent. And all you have to do is mix water and oil together to see that in action. Water is a polar molecule, oil is a nonpolar molecule. Put them in a container, shake them up, and let them sit. They're both going to settle out, and the oil and the water layers will separate from one another. Um, and part of that is got to do with the kinds of intermolecular forces and the strength of those intermolecular forces that would exist between the different molecules and the, their preferred 
intermolecular force. Um, so like dissolves like. We also have the idea of surface tension, viscosity, and capillary action. They're pretty straightforward, so I'm going to suggest that you read your book. Or if you don't want to read your book, but you'd rather read something else, check out the link that we've got here, and that will give you the good overview of those three items and how they relate to intermolecular forces. That's it for General Chemistry 1 as far as new content is concerned. We will see you later, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.